We look tonight at the last of the three poems I'm using to show how poets can warn us about who we are becoming. The poem is called Missing God and is by Dennis Driscoll who died in 2012. Missing God. His grace is no longer called for before meals. Farmed fish multiply without his intercession. Bread production rises through disease-resistant grains devised scientifically to mitigate his faults. Yet, though we rebelled against him like adolescents, uplifted to see an oppressive father banished, a bearded hermit, to the desert, we confess to missing him at times. Miss him during the civil wedding when at the blossomy altar of the registrar's desk we wait in vain to be fed a line containing words like everlasting and divine. Miss him when the TV scientist explains the cosmos through equations leaving our planet to revolve on its axis aimlessly, a wheel skidding in snow. Miss him when the radio catches a snatch of plane chant from some echoey priory, when the gospel choir raises its collective voice to ask, shall we gather at the river? All the forces of the oratorio converge on, I know that my redeemer liveth, and our contracted hearts lose a beat. Miss him when a choked voice at the crematorium recites the poem about fearing no more the heat of the sun. Miss him when we stand in judgment on a lank crucifixion in an art museum, its stripe-like ribs testifying to rank. Miss him when the gamma rays recorded on the satellite graph seem arranged into a celestial score, the music of the spheres, the Ave Verum corpus of the observatory lab. Miss him when we stumble on the breast lump for the first time and an involuntary prayer escapes our lips, when a shadow crosses our bodies on an X-ray screen when we receive a transfusion of foaming blood sacrificed anonymously to save life. Miss him when we call out his name spontaneously in awe or anger as a woman in a birth ward bawls for her long dead mother's name. Miss him when the linen covered dining table holds warm bread rolls, shiny glasses of red wine. Miss him when a dove swoops in the orange grove in a tourist village just as the monastery bell begins to take its toll. Miss him when our journey leads us under leaves of gothic tracery, an arch of overlapping branches that meet like hands in Michelangelo's creation. Miss him when trudging past a church we catch a residual blast of incense a perfume on par with the fresh-baked loaf which Miloch compared to happiness. Miss him when our newly decorated kitchen comes in shaker style and we order a matching set of Mother Anne Lee chairs. Miss him when we listen to the prophecy of astronomers that the visible galaxies will recede as the universe expands. Miss him the way an uncoupled glider riding the evening thermals misses its tug. Miss him as the lovers shrugging shoulders outside the cheap hotel ponder what their next move should be. Even feel nostalgic odd days for his second coming 
like standing in the brick dome of a dovecot after the birds have flown. Dennis O'Driscoll was born in County Tipperary and at the age of 16 became a civil servant in Dublin and remained so for 40 years. Consequently, he once referred to himself as the Lord of the Files. Whereas personally sociable and warm, many of his poems can be temperamentally compared to those of Philip Larkin in their grumpy evocations of everyday life of the misery and consolations of work and their droll directness about provincial living. The literary world was deeply shocked when O'Driscoll died in 2012 at the early age of 58. He once said that one of the fundamental emotions in my poetry is empathy. I have the deepest sense of compassion for the bewilderment that people feel when forced to face on a daily basis all of the daunting things that life throws at them. This poem, Missing God, might be read with this well in mind, as it attempts to give voice to what has been lost in a world where the sense of the sacred has receded. Throughout the poem you get no sense that the poet is judging this faith-diminished world as being somehow dishonest, but we wonder whether the poem is an ambiguous but prophetic warning against an impoverished imagination and colourless universe. Is this a cry from a heart that rejects faith but needs it? A lament for a belief in God that can't be retrieved because the gaps and questions that God once filled have been replaced, but which now open up a melancholic absence. When I read this poem, I often think of Graham Greene's comment that the trouble is, I don't quite believe my unbelief. I often wonder, in this early part of the 21st century, whether the day-to-day -day language we use is actually a lot more secular than we really are. Beyond the blushes that occur when religion is spoken of in public, is the private heart of many still in search of epiphany, meaning, transcendence, God? Is Augustine as right as he ever was that our hearts today are still restless until they rest there. Does the title of this poem, Missing God, refer to the fact that we now miss God because he's disappeared or can't be believed, dismissed by a secular worldview? Or does it also mean we miss him as in we fail to see him, not looking so are not finding, missing him whilst he's there. Perhaps both. What is clear is there is some warning here about something that is taken away when we don't have the patience, the imagination, the attention or the trust that belief in God invites us to pursue. All of us who have belief, of course, go through periods of both missing God because he seems to have gone or missing him in the way in which he's working in our lives and world. As Emily Dickinson said, the doubts and the faith, the reverence and rebellion, the devotion and derelictions that come and go, keep believing nimble. And it was the same Christ who taught his friends to pray our Father, who recited a poem as he died with the words, my God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? To be honest about doubt is to stay in relationship, but to exorcise God is a step far too atheistically fundamentalist for many people for whom an openness about the possibilities of God 
a source of life and love, keep the word intriguingly resonant. Against all the odds, we keep on saying God. A French priest in the 1960s was asked why he got ordained. I got ordained, he said, to help keep the rumor of God stay alive on this earth. The sense of what would be lost if the rumor, which many of us believe to be a true one, simply died out, is for a lot of people who may not think of themselves as religious, still a cold and chilling disenchantment of a world that carries within it a deep sense of both miracle and gift. The poet David Constantine says, poetry keeps on saying what it is we risk losing, what we are losing and what we might do about it. It's a celebration of things that are threatened, things without which life isn't worth it. I can't help but feel this poem is pointing to what we risk losing in the pursuit of some God-free world. We know religions cause a lot of trouble and pain, we know that, but their heartland, their premise, is a sense of awe, gratitude, a belief in good relationship, a life in balance, a less self-obsessed blindness, and a deep conviction that love is the compass with which to navigate a life. And all this because God is. The poem notes the dying embers of the faith that in spirited poems of previous generations, such as Gerard Manley Hopkins' God's Grandeur, where the material world was perceived to be charged with God's majesty and a deep down freshness. The poem is ironically written in the form of a religious litany. A litany is a prayer form that often uses anaphora or word repetition. And 16 times at the beginning of each stanza, O'Driscoll repeats the two words, miss him. The two beats of these words are the poem's constant like the beeps of a life support machine or the short cries of intense despair from a lover forsaken. The cumulative effect, however, does force a revaluation of the mentality and emotion of a world that is no longer sacramental. From the beginning of the poem, we're given impressions of a productive and efficient world that has lost a sense of gratitude. Grace is no longer called for as farmed fish multiply. The poet seems to understand that we have rebelled against a God who was some sort of oppressive father. He refers to the God as bearded hermit, an unworldly being who doesn't go through what the rest of us do. Missing God then goes on to name the places, spaces and moments when the absence of God itself becomes a presence. These include the civil wedding, where the focus of the altar is a bunch of flowers, blossomy, and where there's no intimation of something being everlasting. Likewise, at the crematorium, the choked voices try to console themselves with a reading from Shakespeare's Cymbeline, in which a repetition reminds us that we all come to dust. O'Driscoll seems to be plaintive about that, which the poet Anne Stevenson imagined, of the funeral without a minister, where all the words have nowhere to go, not addressed beyond themselves. Imagine them, she writes, those words, circling and circling the confusing cemetery, roving the earth without anywhere to rest. In Missing God too, he notes how we miss God looking at a crucifix in an art museum. For the Christian, God empties himself in the incarnation and in a body language, 
we know as Jesus Christ, stretches open his arms in an embrace on wood in a cry of forsakenness. But in that moment it is believed, God has never been nearer. Strangely, later in the poem, the poet refers to blood sacrificed anonymously to save life. It is Christ here who is anonymous now, but frustratingly at a time when the freshness and radical nature of his teaching has the potential to transform a material, competitive, rank-infested slog of a life into a spiritual adventure of deepening relationships and trust. If it is true that we're just spending money we don't have on things we don't want in order to impress people we don't like, then the teachings of the one whose ribs now confuse us in a gallery are well overdue to be heard. Similarly, those who trudge past a church and smell incense or hear the monastery bell have a stirring of something other, a sense of strangeness that feels almost like home, but they move on. O'Driscoll says he feels nostalgic, an important word from the Greek nostos, which Odysseus-like means a return to your homeland. He recognizes that this return appears impossible, as empty of hope as a dovecote from which the birds have fled. But the magnetism of mystery we know as God no longer draws people out of some burrowing underground unless feeling life is a wheel skidding in snow or a breast lump is newly found and an involuntary prayer escapes our lips. It's likely then to be a prayer of need rather than of praise. The person of faith reading this poem might feel overwhelmed by the picture O'Driscoll paints, but may also feel sympathetic to what is being voiced. We know that those who are seeking the spiritual today often without a natural vocabulary for their soul, feel that the church is just too secular, too caught up in the things from which they want to be freed. There's no doubt that the community of Christian faith, having spent centuries on working out the form of Christianity, must now concentrate on what it is for. We are being thrown back to our basics. And if there is a crisis of faith, then a good crisis must not go to waste. Perhaps it is time for Christianity to do some stock-taking, self-scrutiny, distillation. In the church we spend a lot of energy on asking how we might be loyal to the past. Another question emerges in the culture O'Driscoll interrogates how might this faith be loyal to our future? What is it that might make belief in God a gift to the world again, and not as we seem to behave just to religion? How might faith in God be generous in conversation and learning instead of being defensive and dogmatic? So much talk of God has been punitive in focus over the centuries, a God out to take revenge on human depravity, it's surely time to start talking again, as the scriptures do, of a restorative God who takes it upon himself to uphold human dignity. Although we have often begun with idolatry and ended in violence, for the Christian all must start in wonder and end in humility. The voices in the poem seem to have some consciousness that this might indeed be a way to understand the world and the human heart better. Many of you will know the story of the famous atheist Voltaire on his deathbed. The local parish priest visited him 
and urged him again and again, you must renounce the devil, Monsieur. Cast out Satan, you must shun the devil and all his works. Oh, it's a bit late to start making enemies, said Voltaire. Perhaps death keeps God alive for many. But for me, it is all the ordinary miracles of this life, birth and breath, love and loss, music, science, art, relationships, sacrifice and selflessness, and the world's amazing beauty that perhaps appropriately as we end these three talks, all make me believe even in the face of suffering and shadow, of unanswered questions and doubts that do dance in my head, that lead me to believe that God is in this world as poetry is in the poem. To miss this would be, for me, a loss, a great unbearable loss and would feel as if it were my humanity itself that had gone missing. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen.
I will pour out a spirit of compassion and supplication on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that when they look on the one whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Let us pray. Grant, Lord, that we may miss you, and in missing you come to know our need of you. I need you, Lord, this night. I need you as the darkness closes in, as the crowds gather, as the priests and soldiers meet. I need you, Lord, as the wood is cut for a cross. I need you as the thorns are uprooted and woven into a crown. I need you as the tomb is prepared vinegar is poured. I need you as nails are sharpened. I need you in all that lies ahead. Lord, meet me on the road. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, grant us yourself. Grant us your body, anointed and kissed, beaten, broken and bled. 
grant us yourself burning in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As you have blessed us, grant that we may be a blessing to others. Grant us grace to receive all who come to this cathedral in coming days as if we are receiving you, for we are receiving you. Grant us grace to worship you as fervently here as in our homes, as fervently in our homes as we do you here. Grant grace, your very presence and your life to all who work in these coming days, for all who are away and all who worship in secret or alone. For with you, by your Spirit, with the help of your holy angels, we never worship alone. And the songs of praise deafen the heavens. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who watch or wait or weep, for all who do not know to watch, for all whose hearts are deadened, for all unable to see, for all, Lord, you are calling us to be, to know, to taste. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, as we stand at the foot of the cross of your Son, help us to see and know your love for us, so that in humility, love, and joy, we may place at his feet all that we have and all that we are. Through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. May God bless us, that in us may be found love and humility, obedience and thanksgiving, discipline, gentleness, and peace. Amen.